You're listening to Soul Food with North Shore Church. Challenges are happening all around us, but they're also happening inside of our souls. In each episode of Soul Food, we will dive into the needs and longings of our souls. That way, we can experience God's healing in every aspect of our lives. Thanks for joining us. Now it's time to feed your soul. Here are your hosts, Scott Scruggs and Sue Dills. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Soul Food Podcast. Uh, This is episode three. I am Scotty Scruggs, and I'm joined by Sue Dills, the Director of Support and Recovery at North Shore Church. Sue, how are you? I'm good. You're good? Yeah, excited to be here. They are. Yep, February. It is February. And the sun is out. Oh, man. It's a miracle. And it's cold. (laughs) Yeah. So if you're in the Northwest right now, you're all celebrating that. And if you're elsewhere, you probably have that all the time. So Too bad, so sad. Too bad for us. But uh, thank you for joining us. We're so glad that you're here. As we dive in and have these conversations just about how we can care for our souls, especially in this challenging season. Mm. And Sue, I have, each time we've done this, I've reflected a lot. It's been helpful a lot for me to think about just caring for my own soul and especially that last conversation we had about boundaries mm. and just trying to think through what am I responsible for? And here's the big one. What am I not responsible for? Totally. Right? What are the things that I can to want to consume responsibility over, but actually I need to be able to let those things go. So mm-hmm. super, super helpful. Uh, thanks for that. And then today we're going to dive in and talk about relationships, uh, which is something everybody has. Yep. Somewhere or another, no, whether do. it's family, friendships, uh, loved ones, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, there's just all sorts of relationships. We all have those. Um, and as you said before, they have a lot of power in our lives. Oh, they so do. Just, just unpack that. Well, power for for blessing, for enrichment, for intimacy, for um, affirmation of who we are. And then we have those relationships where it, it just sucks the air out of us and it feels like we're disconnected and actually damaged by the interactions we're having with people. So I think it's really good for us to kind of pause and look at what are relational builders in our lives that sort of drive us toward uh, healthy, good, close relationships. And then what are those things that actually are relational destroyers or relationship busters? What are those, mm. what are those things that just don't help us when we're relating to people? So maybe less trying to figure out, like, is this a good or bad person, but what do I need to do to help build into this relationship? And then what yeah. are the behaviors that I have that may be... Well said. Well yeah. said. Yeah. What do we need to own in this to help yeah. us be good at building relationships rather than destroying relationships? And Sue, I've just... I, it's so important right now, isn't it? Oh, I mean, totally. if you think about... I mean, not only are we often in close quarters, and depending on what you're going through, wherever you're listening from or watching from, you may have people that you're around a lot, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, or maybe feeling quite isolated and seeing yeah. people through screens or on phone calls. Um, but I know even in my own life, in the season, it feels like all the tensions, both the good things and the tensions in my relationships have kind of been heightened. Yes. And yes. how much I need people is heightened, but also how much I feel sensitive to how the mm-hmm. hurts can happen yeah. and how vulnerable we are to the, uh, just with other people. And I have a friend who used to say, it takes people to make people sick and it takes people to make people well. And on the one hand, I suppose that could go with this whole pandemic era, but really that's actually true when it comes to what we need for our souls. Yes. And so I'm excited to dive in and kind of uh, first get into some of the builders and then we can talk about some of those things that maybe are more detrimental as we think about our relationships. So jump in. What's a key relationship builder as you see it? Well, I think there are a lot of builders and this list won't be exhaustive, but my first one is something called hearing the heart. And when we hear a person's heart, we're doing more than just listening with our ears, um, which is a part of it. We're not, we tend not to be, and maybe I shouldn't say we, I tend not to be a really good listener. But one of the first places to start uh, in helping to build a relationship is to actually listen well to the person we're with. So that means I'm fully focused on them and I actually get in their well. So if you think about getting in the well with someone, you're getting in 
a well with them, and that's their experience. They're, they're in this place, and they're looking to share with you, and they're looking to be seen, to be valued, to be heard. So if you're getting in the well with someone, you're kind of putting aside your own need to talk, your own need to advise them um, and you're fully hearing them you're kind of like absorbing what they're saying you're hearing beyond the words you're looking for the feelings the body language and then you're able to say back to them wow you know thanks for sharing that that must be super impacting or I hear how hard that is and then that person knows that you've really caught them and they feel seen and heard I have an example from my own life. I've got a, a friend named Patty. And actually, just this last week, she and I were talking, and she got in the well with me. And she said, after I had shared some things, she goes, wow, you know, that just must have impacted you in this way. And or she kind of followed it up by, I, I think that must have made you feel blank, blank, blank. And I could correct her, but her even trying to identify the feeling behind my experience just felt so loving. And I mm. felt so, I felt like somebody was in my camp and with me really experiencing and trying to understand what I was going through. Yeah. That's a huge builder to me because I think we live busy lives. We tend to be dismissive. We walk past people pretty quickly, and we don't just pause and really listen and attend to what they're saying. I was going to say, the whole image of getting in the well is a time-consuming image. Yeah. It's like, I got to climb down there. I got I to gotta be in there with them. I'm not planning my escape route to get out. I'm not just passing by. Um, I think it much more like, you know, be at the bus stop with someone where it's like, hey, good to see you, moving on to the next thing. Right. But you're describing something different. And uh, I know even as I hear it, I, I think two things. One, I think, wow, that's so challenging to do because hmm. I'm busy and I've got stuff to do. And, and uh, I mean, I'll be honest, sometimes I'm just selfish. It's like, I don't want to have to spend time on someone else's stuff. It's like, I got my own stuff to sort out. And so all that stuff, but on the other hand, and this is maybe the secret to trying to access this personally for me is I think about when someone's done that for me hmm. and when I was at my wits end into my rope or just totally out of gas and someone came beside me and was with me and it was more important that they were just attempting to try to think about life in my shoes than trying to assess it evaluate it prescribe it right. assess it even get me out of it um, which you know the older I get the less I really feel like that's helping me and the more I just, again, I think that's a beautiful image of just being in the well, being in that place. It's really about presence, isn't it? It is. Presence is that key word. And I think with presence, we're not only seeing the person, but we're connecting heart to heart with the person. So we're with them. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm learning that a lot in marriage, too. Uh, I bet I'm you sure, are. I'm sure, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think you, we all do. You had a little glint in your eye when you said that. I bet you are, right? No, but just that sense of, you know, one of... As Nina and I have learned how to um, do conflict and connect and work through hard things, just for me, it's so easy to say, I just, I, I don't want her to feel this way. Right. If it's a hard feeling or a hard moment. And, and first, learning that I can be okay if she's not okay and she can be okay if I'm not okay. A friend of mine mm -hmm. used to say, you know, like, I, you know, in counseling her to deal with some of my stuff, like if Scotty's on the roller coaster, you don't have to ride it with him. You can just, yeah. I'll be here when you get off. Yeah. But then you're there. And then that sense of just being able to say, it's more important that I try to let my, my mind and body and heart try to imagine and experience and listen and be present to what she's going through, no matter what those feelings are, even if they're negative feelings about me. Yeah, yeah. And not get defensive and push that away, but say, hey, the, the feelings aren't the facts. The facts are just everything that's built around all of our feelings. But it's like just being able to validate those. Mm -hmm. It's so huge. And again, it's those two things. I resist it because I don't want to do it. And I can be selfish and I can be busy with life. But then I know how much I need it. Yeah. And so I, you've you've spoken already into my, my life mm -hmm. and my relationships just by naming that one, hearing the heart and getting in the well. I love that. So good for all of us. Yeah. Um, I think the second one is we've talked about boundaries last time, last podcast, but good boundaries between two people is a tremendous relational builder. And if everybody recalls, our boundaries are kind of our personal territory, what, right. we, what we steward, what we're responsible for. 
And when both people have good boundaries, they can kind of be independent and yet interdependent in a very appropriate way. What tends to happen if people don't have good boundaries is that one person can be an over-controller and the other person could be the codependent. And what I mean by that is that an over-controller is kind of the one who takes charge, right? right? And could be making decisions for the other person, could be telling them what they need to do or how they need to act or what they're feeling. Yeah, I think of it sort of like it's like the shotgun driver where it's like they're always saying where to turn. And a person who should be driving is just, you know, I'll go left because you said left. And exactly. even if I think I should be going right and I actually know the way, you said left, I'll turn left. Totally. And it's something like that's what you're describing? Yep, yeah. absolutely. I, and I think I've been and guilty of that. I've never that. done that. I just want to know that. never, <laughs> I've never, I'm not guilty of that. Oh, so. you are, you are so perfect. Um, <laughs> please don't talk to Nina about this. Yeah. Nina, if you're listening, oh, I know I Jeff you. wouldn't like it either. No. Oh, so I think the other part of this is the codependency part, and that is um, those of us that are the people pleasers. So we will just go with the flow with whatever the stronger person says or does. You know, totally ignoring our own opinions, feelings, decisions. And imagining that's good for the relationship, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, the impulse is this will be better. Yeah. It's going to smooth things out and they'll be happy and we'll be closer by. And yeah. it, it doesn't work, does it? Oh, I tell you, it doesn't. And I've lived a lot of my life in this kind of bondage of having to sort of second guess what do they want to hear? Mm. And I will tell them what they want to hear. And a lot of that was fear-driven, where I was afraid they wouldn't like me, they would leave the relationship, um, they would just, you know, bully me or whatever, even more. Right. And yet it's such an unhealthy way to live, and there's no freedom in the relationship. So I think the more we work on our stuff and look at our lives and think, you know, am I being too controlling in this situation with this person? Am I people pleasing right now in order to not offend or to stay loved? Those kinds of things we need to look at because uh, if we do have healthy boundaries in a relationship, it's, it, it draws us closer. It's a relational builder. Yeah. So, and for everyone listening, uh, you know, we all live, it's not really a binary either or we're on a spectrum there, right? Where it's yeah. like I can drift, I know I drift usually to the people pleasing side. Yeah. Uh, on the Enneagram, I'm a three with a strong two wing. So I get that kind of people pleasing energy uh -huh. and how I'm wired. And, um, and there's also folks who are just kind of wired to have more of that controlling. And so it's not to mm -hmm. even make like, you know, deify those things or make them mm -hmm. like awful, but just to say, uh, where do I tend to go, especially in my relationships? That's right. And then how do I kind of challenge myself back to the middle? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's great. You had a third one. It's being self-aware, isn't it? It is. I do have a third one. It's just the fact of giving lots of grace. Um, I think we can be heavy at times on criticism and complaining in our relationships, but what if we were to change it to be, just be lots of giving of grace, lots of affirming, lots of validation, lots of forgiveness. And I love this word coined, repairing the rupture. We all have things that happen in our relationships where we fail, we sin, we goof up, and we need to be able to repair ruptures in our relationship. Sometimes that is moving toward and just saying, hey, I really blew it. I know that hurt you. I can see it all over your face. Please forgive me. Uh, those kinds of words are so healing, and it, if anything, it kind of draws you closer together again, just like in under the boundaries thought, healthy boundaries. So I think what we really want to do is just reframe and realize we're living with someone or we have a friend, and they're not perfect. I shouldn't expect that they are, and there's going to be a need to give grace yeah. and repair yeah. rupture. When I was a young adult pastor, I remember working with lots of, you know, college students, 20-somethings around relationships, often dating relationships. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I would get was, you know, after a certain number of weeks where you're kind of in that, it's so much fun and they're so great and they're perfect and we're having a blast, but then there start to have be conflict. Yeah. And uh, so they would come and ask, you know, well, I'm worried because there's conflict. And, and I would have to remind them, conflict isn't the issue, it's how you're able to repair it. Mm -hmm. And I, I grew up in an environment that was, um, I would say more on the avoid conflict side. And all of this is on a spectrum. So it's not a binary thing, but more on the avoid conflict than in the sort of loud kind of conflict environment. So it's like I, I understood that, uh, this kind of fear of conflict or fear of going there. But 
it's really not about if there's going to be a fight or an argument or conflict. It's that sense of, can we repair it? Yeah. And what do I need to bring to the table to do that? Yep. And uh, because I, I meet so many people, um, even couples who've been married a long, long time, that can still feel such great pain over the conflict itself. And then say, okay, mostly it's about what are the tactics and strategies for the, having the grace to be able to repair. Mm. Um, so I think that's I think that's really key. Have you seen that? I mean, you're obviously working with lots of folks. When someone comes and says, hey, I'm struggling to figure out how to repair the rupture, what do you yeah. tell them? You know, that's such a good question. It really depends on the context. And yeah. it depends on how much hurt and harm are going on. And in a little bit, we're going to talk about the relational busters, which has to do with betrayal. And I think when we get to that, the conversation is kind of an ongoing one. Right. But I always think it's a first step toward the person that we may have offended to reach out, yeah. kind of an olive leaf, and say, hey, you know, was I too much? Yeah. Did I hurt you? I think just opening, being brave enough to open those kinds of conversations and just acknowledge where we may have failed is huge. Right. Someone once told me it's it's about turning towards. Yeah. Right. And it's less about, we, we get in these empathy standoffs where it's like, I'm not going to cave. You're not going to cave. No one's going to cave. Who's going to cave? And you just don't want to. Because like, well, I feel hurt, so I shouldn't have to cave. Yeah. I shouldn't have to turn towards you. I shouldn't have to speak the first word. You should be coming and take care of me versus saying, if we both agree as best as we're able to turn towards. Mm -hmm. That's actually like 80%. I mean, I don't know if it's an exact percentage. You might know, but a lot of the percentage, majority of that repair is just right. that turning towards. Yeah. Keeps our hearts soft too, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Because I think once we make that decision, I'm not going to move toward, we actually harden. And it's wow. it's sort of hard to crack that shell once we've done that too many times. So wow. we want to stay soft. Right. And that takes us, you mentioned it, some of the busters, some of the things that are kind of the relationship killer, so to speak. Yeah. So walk through some of the key ones that you see. In your yeah, world. absolutely. So first on my list is, it's three words. Well, three ideas, perfectionism, idealism, and then unrealistic expectations. Wow. And I've got all those in space <laughs> in my life. So thank, thank you for naming my, my whole story. Thank I'll you. I'll tell you. Uh, I share your pain here. Mm -hmm. um, perfectionism, you know, I think we sometimes think it's okay to be to struggle with that but really underneath that is the potential for damaging our relationships with people um, I heard someone say that perfectionism is actually def a defense at feeling insignificant mm. um, and a it defense at feeling insignificant, insignificant. yeah which is wow. kind of a, uh, yeah. an amazing thought, but it puts it in the context of relationships and it doesn't keep it just in its own little silo. Um, it has to do with more of our needs to have the world ordered and have everything where we think it should be. And the eyes are not on the other person. And really right. when we're loving other people, we need to kind of look at our impact to others. So I think uh, perfectionism is one of those um, relational busters. I think idealism, sometimes we think our relationships need to look this perfect way. And really, because we're human, none of us are perfect. So yeah. it's almost like this false thing we're reaching after that is maybe nice to, if it, you could attain it, but it's not realistic. Yeah. And we can get frustrated because we can't For attain sure. it. One of my favorite writers and theologians is a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Mm. And he has this wonderful little book called Life Together. And in it, he writes about how the secret to authentic uh, Christian community or Christ-like community or holistic community is actually destroying the dream of ideal, like an idyllic community. Yeah. Because in that, we actually don't have the place for our messiness, our brokenness, mm -hmm. and our way that God can give us grace to move through that. And I imagine a similar thing in relationships where it's like, if I'm just idealizing, I have to have the perfect marriage, yeah. perfect relationship, perfect dating relationship, perfect family life, perfect parents, perfect kids. It kind of breaks down pretty quick. It does. And then I can't see the person before me and how to move forward with them together. Mm -hmm. It's how do I get this to feel perfect mm -hmm. according to my definition of perfect as well, right? Right. So almost, I can totally see that. Yeah. It almost feels manipulative, doesn't it? It's like uh -huh. I'm trying to yeah. to coax you to be a certain way or me to be a certain yeah. way. It puts a lot of pressure on one another. Oh, my another. goodness. And it's you're just, I mean, as a 
parent of younger kids, it's, <laughs> wow, I'm just, I'm feeling that deeply right now. Oh, so, because I, I do, it's like, I have almost four year old and it's like, I can see myself parenting, but also, you know, ha- like using perf- my perfectionism to like wielding it on her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's a real fine line to say, I want her to learn and grow and we have to have boundaries and discipline, but I also can't have this standard that she's going to have to live under because I just feel like that's the way a kid needs to look when they're three or whatever it may be. So, exactly. Yeah. And let them be okay with being messy too, because yeah. we are as well. I think along these lines, it's really good to remind one another that you know, since we are imperfect, the ideals don't have to be the God or a God in our lives, something that we need to move toward. And it enslaves us. And I think along with that, we haven't really spoken about it yet, but just our unrealistic expectations we can have of ourselves and of others. And I think if we don't look at those unrealistic expectations, they can become demands, which drive us to performance, which prevents us from presence. Wow. And we started with presence. We're looking at being present with the other, can which you means. Say that again? Just, I hope I can yeah, actually, but yeah, yeah, we were talking about just you know imperfection. Well, actually, I lost it. Maybe you can. It was something uh, about how it drives us to performance, performance, which removes us from presence. I think right. Those are two key words right. for me is that sense of it's driving me to perform, removes me from presence. That's really really powerful. And our goal is love, at which builds our relationships. And so if we're camping on the performance or the, the expectations, I think is where we started on that, that it's, it's really, it enslaves. Yeah. It enslaves the relationships. So we want to be conscious when we're doing that, that that actually can bring harm. I actually once asked the pastor who married Nina and me, you know, what was the secret to your marriage? Because I have so much respect for it. And he said, a low bar. And I <laughs> laughed at that because it was like, well, I mean, and he, he said it in jest. It wasn't just, it wasn't to me flip or um, superficial about it. Mm. But it actually, there was a secret there to say, hey, look, we're not here to, to put this standard that neither of us can attain. And then we just battle over it forever. Like right. we actually have to start with appropriate expectations for another human being. Yeah. Who yeah. is imperfect. And has all kinds of stuff they bring into the relationship that's going to be imperfect. And so I, I get that. I hear that. So <laughs> what was another one? Another one is control. And we talked about this a little bit with boundaries, but I'm going to flesh it out a bit more. Where control demands um, things of others rather than allowing the person to steward their own yard. And control is power. So we actually, through our voice and through our forcefulness can mute the other person and Mm -hmm. diminish them, uh, which takes away a lot of their self-respect. I mean, we're not respecting them when we do that. And internally, the person who's experiencing someone who's trying to control them or tell them what to do or advise them um, can feel resentful inside because it's like, I didn't invite you into this space. You're in my yard. You're making this decision for me, or you're trying to tell me how to live my life. And I, that's my yard. That's what I steward. Mm -hmm. This played plays out in uh, my home life, even currently now where I have become the queen of nag nag i have the queen, what is the that queen, like of the queen of nag what well you, you know oh my gosh like? he would say you don't need to remind me about that i remember or he's very he's very gracious but i can see it in my life where i will be afraid that maybe they'll forget or that i need to kind of be you know on it or tell my son you know you really should be doing your homework now and then i'll remind him again five minutes later and then five minutes later and five minutes later and i think nah. you know we've gotten into this relational dance that isn't helpful for them because internally they can resent and then I actually have have made them small I've I've taken over their life and I'm trying to manage it rather than letting them steward their own yard Mm. now when people are not responsible or they need prompts to help that's different but when I just intrude upon and automatically assume you need me to help you live your life that's really disrespectful and I've learned 
me and I both, because we both will do that to each other. It's actually, I, I put our ass what it looks like, because it's like we both kind of have that impulse to remind or whatever. We actually will use the word to each other. Whoever's doing it, we'll call them the nagravator. And, uh, <laughs> I love it. Because, it, you know, it's aggravating. So it's like, but you'll feel it, right? Because it just feels, but one of the things that we've worked on is you can actually negotiate uh, the prompting part. Yes. To say, you know, you know, she could say, Scotty, you know, it seems like, you struggle to close the garage. Like, I mean, it, I don't know. You may not. Maybe it's whatever. But like you can, because at time, you know, and I don't want to have to be the person who's always, and I love that because she doesn't want to be, I don't want to have to feel responsible if it's my right. duty. So what can we agree on? Is it a question you ask? Is it a prompt? Is it before we go to sleep to say, hey, did you, so we can agree on it so it doesn't feel like control. Yeah. It's, we've actually, I've said, I need help remembering. Can you remind me? That's different than Nagravating. Yes. So being able to pause <laughs> and negotiate where, because there might be a need. Like right. Said. Like I think, because, you know, I've been in situations and I'm sure you have where it's like, if I don't say something, I know what's going to happen here because I've watched the pattern. Yeah. So how do we back up and negotiate that so it's not control? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's respecting the other person in the right. mix of that. So yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I think another relational destroyer is contempt. And mm -hmm. I don't think we talk about this very often, but um, this could be being in a relationship with someone. There's someone is standing right next to you and you're talking and having a side conversation about all the things this person does wrong or how they failed. Um, it's kind of like public humiliation. But it also can show up in things like eyeball rolls you know, you know, you just said what, yeah. and and it's this again, kind of a putting a person down. Contempt, I think, is a relational killer, and yet it is fairly common. Yeah. And how we just hub up with people, and it could be somebody we don't like that much, so we'll talk in a very negative way about them behind their backs or in front of them, yeah. and or just the, internally. Yes, and contempt can be a very quiet. It can. Fact, Thank I you for find, saying that. At least in how I'm wired, when I'm tempted towards that, I, I get quiet. Yep. And I hold those deep because I don't because it is. I'm not going to say that publicly because I want to be the nice guy. Yeah. I don't, you know, but there's something inside. Yep. Um, John Gottman, who's as you know an incredible relational expert, done a lot of research. He's over at UW. And, mm -hmm. um, they talk about the four horsemen of the, uh, you know, of the letter like, relationship killers, and contempt is one of them. Yeah, I love that. Um, I love contempt is one of those killers. It's like it just it is is a killer. Yeah, relationships. And it's easy, you know, we were talking about the pandemic, and it's just so easy when we're stressed and frustrated and life feels awfully heavy. It's yeah. easy to go there. And yet I think we just need to realize that it's capable of great harm in our relationships. So, you know, as much as we need to just kind of offload steam, don't bring contempt in toward the other. Um, it's just, it's just a killer. Right. So and you had one more, I do have one more. And my last is breaking trust and betrayal. Mm -hmm. And this is a pretty huge one. It can play out in lots of different ways. It could be where we've had a secret that we've hid from someone from the get go. And all of a sudden it comes out and the person can feel like, well, why didn't you tell me this 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. You know, why am I finding out about it now? Um, it can play out in marriages through affairs or porn. It can play out in financial misdealings. Um, there's lots of ways that we can break someone's trust in us. Um, and I think it's important to say that it's a killer, but we can repair. It's like that repair of rupture we were talking about earlier. But also trust has to be earned back because there has to be um, a season when a person's behavior has consistencies so, and gives time for the person who's been damaged by the trust betrayal to recuperate right. and to, to begin to trust again. So um, in my life, it played out where I knew that before my husband and I married, he had struggled with porn. And we were doing great right after marriage. And then three months later, he was laid off from his job. And I thought he was doing pretty good, but then it came out he wasn't doing pretty good and he was viewing porn again. And, uh, you know, for those of us who are wives, we take this deep, deep into our hearts. And there was a season when I needed to have Jeff evidence for me his sobriety. And over time, 
that, you know, his consistency and his transparency were the game changers, but it took some time and that trust was earned back. So I just say that to those in our community because I know that this isn't a, um, it, it's kind of a common unfortunate thing that happens in marriages at times where there is a break in trust and, and in other relationships. And so realizing that trust has to be earned back, you have to see fruit. If you see continuing repetitive behavior, that's going to delay rebuilding that relationship, and it's going to cause distrust to fester. Right. So, um, you know, I think it's possible, and it surely is something we want to attain, but to realize there's an impact when we break trust. Well, Sue, I appreciate you sharing that story, and for everybody who's listening or watching It's a great moment to pause and say, if you're in a moment or a situation like that, if trust has been broken on whatever level, because even Mm -hmm. small levels can start to add up. um, It's an important moment to pause, get help, get in community, reach out, Mm -hmm. um, start with a trusted friend, because I think the repair process is so important and it is possible. Yes, it is. And it can't be rushed, Mm -hmm. but it also shouldn't be forsaken. And uh, I know just as you were sharing, there's just... uh, it is the deepest thing about our human need that makes relationships work is trust. Yeah. And as a pastor, I would often tell, I often tell people, of course it is because the deepest thing we need from God is we have to trust him Mm. and that our relationship is sustained by just that, that, uh, deep sense of trust and faithfulness and fidelity. Mm. Uh, But just as God is gracious and forgives, we can be that way as well. That's right. And, um, I think about any of these relationship busters, uh, what gives me hope as I look at those things, things like perfectionism, idealism, expectations, control, contempt, breaking trust. I mean, it's like that's a heavy list. It is. And, and all, those, uh, all those things can be overcome with grace and time and truth mm-hmm. and good people in your life. So Amen. if you're looking for those things, uh, please reach out. Uh, we would love to be helpful mm-hmm. with that. And Sue, I'm just so grateful for you leading this conversation uh, I have learned a lot again, and I have so much more to work on. So thanks a lot. Oh. <laughs> um, but, don't we all? Uh, don't we all? But uh, for sure. thanks for joining us, and we will ch- uh, talk to you next time. Great, thank you. This has been Soul Food with North Shore Church. We're thrilled that you tuned into our show. Until next time, you can find us online at northshore.church, or say hi on social media at North Shore Church on Instagram or North Shore Community on Facebook. We would love to hear from you.